In this video, what we're going to be taking a look at is how to determine an appropriate minimum sample size. Right? And the reason why this is important is that if you ever have to collect a sample, typically sampling is expensive. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort, it costs a lot of money to go about and sample a whole bunch of people. So what you need to know is, okay, what's that minimum sample size that I would need to obtain in order to get the results that I want? So a okay, big part of that, what results do you want, right? And I don't mean kind of uh, forcing, torturing your data to get some value that you're looking for, but I mean to get a level of error that you're happy with. That's what I mean by the results that you want. So we'll take a look at that first. We'll take a look at how to determine appropriate sample size. We'll look at that for calculating sample mean, as well as if you're trying to collect data for sample proportions. We'll then wrap up after that, taking a look at the FPC or the finite population correction factor. And that one there, again, that is not to be confused with when we were dealing with our binomial approximation. That was our continuity correction factor. Very, very different situation. So let's start off by taking a look at determining minimum sample size. So in determining minimum sample size, what you're wanting to take a look at is really saying, okay, we want some sample size that is going to be greater than or equal to. Right? And that is we're saying this is the minimum value that I want. I want something ideally bigger, right? Bigger is always better, but this would be the minimum that I should obtain, some value of n. So let's just jump straight into taking a look at what this works out to. This is going to be z times the standard deviation of x all over my maximum allowable sampling error, e we'll then square all of these results. So let's talk about what each one is. Starting off, Z. Z is the level of confidence that I'm interested in. So, okay, what is my level of confidence? That is, do I want to obtain a sample mean, right? This is all for obtaining some estimate of the mean. Do I want this value of the mean to cover the true population mean 99% of the time? 90? 95, 80, right? What is that level of confidence that I'm interested in? So that is the same as what we're looking at for our confidence intervals. And thus we would calculate Z in much the same way. So if I wanted a 99% confidence interval, I'd use 2.3, uh, what did we say that one was? 2.35, no, I can't even remember what it was. 95% confidence interval was 1.96. Right, so we'd use the confidence intervals, the value of z appropriately as we've calculated in the past. Sigma, well, this is the true population proportion, right? This is our population, sorry, not population proportion. My good, my my goodness, my mind is a mess. Sigma x, this is our population standard deviation. Right, the true population standard deviation. So this must be known in our scenario. We must know what this population standard deviation is. E then, E is going to be our maximum allowable sampling error. So we'll just put in here sampling error. And right, sampling error, what was that? That was X bar minus mu, right? That was my sampling error. How far my estimate fell from the true population. And so in that case there, x bar minus mu is saying that is the most, the largest amount that I'm willing to have my x bar deviate. So how accurate do I want these results to be? Well, let's jump right into an example with this to see how exactly we could, how exactly we could use this. So, okay, let's say that Ah, we want to take a look at the amount of time that corporate executives watch television. So we know from prior studies that altogether there is a um, standard deviation of three hours between corporate executives between how much they watch TV, right? And that is, hey, a previous study, a previous study also estimated the average time to be 12. Right? This is the amount of time per week. So, hey, they watched on average 12 hours per week with a standard deviation of three. We want to check this. We want to say, really, is that true? Do we agree with this? Maybe I think corporate executives watch a lot less TV than that. Maybe they watch more. But we want to check this. We're not happy with this initial study. 
we want to see for ourselves. So this is the data that we want to check. So let's just circle that. Let's say that we want to conduct this for a, we'll do a 95% confidence interval. And we want our estimate to be within 15 minutes, right? So we want whatever value of X bar that we calculate to be within 15 minutes of the true population mean. So, okay, keep in mind, hours, hours, minutes. So, okay, 15 minutes, that is 0 0.25 hours. Okay. We have everything we need. Let's go and calculate what our minimum sample size should be. So n is greater than or equal to z for a 95%. So our z for a confidence interval for 95%. So hey, we can work that out. 95 divided by 2 is 0.475. If you go to your table, just to confirm, you go look up the probability of 0 0.4750, we get a Z value of plus or minus 1.96. So we'll just use that positive 1.96. There we go. Sigma, that was estimated in a previous one. It's thought to be three. And we want a maximum allowable error of 15 minutes or 0.25 hours. Okay, so what does that work out to? We have 1.96 times 3 divided by 0.25. Take all of that to the square, right? Square all of that. And we would get that n is greater than or equal to 553. Um, one nine. So that is, hey, n should be greater than or equal to 554. That is, hey, if I want 19 out of 20 times to cover that true population mean and to get an estimate within 15 minutes of the true population mean, I would need to sample 554 executives to get an idea as to the average amount of TV they watch in a week. So quite a bit, right? Quite a bit in this case here. But gives us an idea as to our sample size, how many we should be aiming for. Again, the big thing with sampling, more is always better. The more, the bigger the sample, the more accurate our results. The bigger the sample, the more that distribution of sample means, that normal distribution of sample means, the more it collapses into a spike around the population mean. So bigger sample is always a better sample. What about if we wanted to do the same thing for proportion, right? Say we were doing polling and we wanted to figure out, hey, do we have, right? Again, let's go back to this kind of idea. Does candidate M have majority support? Maybe this is what we're looking for, right? We're polling. We want to know, hey, does candidate M have majority support? And let's say we are actually interested. Yeah, let's just say simply majority support. So that is we want a P, right? You'll also see that is pi of 0 0.50. Do they have that 50% threshold for majority support or do they not? Let's suppose again, we want this for a 95%. 95% confidence. And we'll say again that we want a level of maximum allowable error. Say we want this estimate. Do we have majority support? We want this to be quite accurate. We want it to be within 1%. So plus or minus one percentage point. Maybe down to 49, maybe up to 51, right? We want it to be pretty accurate within sense of that. How do we work this out? Well, very similarly, we can get N must be greater than or equal to, and in this case here, p or pi, what we think that true population one is, one minus p, all over z standard or uh, maximum allowable error, right? So what I think my proportion is, what I think the opposite of that proportion is, one minus p, the level of confidence, and my maximum allowable error. 
So, okay, working this guy here out, do they have majority support? That was 50%. So that's going to be 50. 1 minus 50 is going to be, again, 50. Z for a 95% confidence interval, that was 1.96. And I wanted that within a 1% maximum allowable error. So, okay, 1.96 divided by 0.01 squared times 0.5 times 0.5 gives me, hey, if I want that, I should be getting a sample size which is greater than or equal to 9,604. So at minimum, I should be surveying 9,604 people in order to get that estimate within plus or minus one percentage point. So how I can work out for our proportions. Yeah. Okay, so that's our determining our minimum sampling error, or sorry, not our minimum sampling error, our minimum sample size that we should look at in each case. Minimum sample size if we were trying to calculate a meth, um, sample mean, and minimum sample size if we were trying to estimate our sample proportion. What we're going to be moving on to next is taking a look at our finite population correction factor. And let's first talk about why this is needed. So what we see with our standard errors with this finite population correction factor, or even, even without the finite population correction factor, is when we were estimating X bar. So let's suppose we were estimating X bar and we said, hey, this is normally distributed centered around the true population mean with a standard error equal to the standard deviation of x all over root n. And if we focus in on the standard errors bit here, what we notice is that, hey, standard errors, standard deviation of x all over root n. What we witness is that as n gets bigger, this whole term get smaller, right? Our standard error is how far any one value of x bar is likely to be away from the mu shrinks. Okay, this works. This is great as long as n, right? And by n, I mean population n is sufficiently large. The problem happens, right? Such that really n is infinite in scope. The problem arises is when n is actually relatively small. That is, if we had, say, an n of 50, and we pulled out a sample size of 40, well, hey, we're sampling almost the entire population. That is, what's happening is this guy is going up, but this whole thing here isn't collapsing fast enough. We're almost at the whole population, so we should have a very, very accurate idea as to what this is, right? X bar should be very accurate, but our standard errors are not collapsing fast enough. That's where our finite population correction factor comes into play. When n approaches n, right? So when sample size approaches population size, we need to correct our standard errors to account for that finite population. And that finite population correction factor, quite, quite relatively easy to work through. What it's going to be is we're going to be looking at n minus n all over n minus 1. So population size minus our sample size all over population minus 1. All we would do right, to apply this finite population correction factor is we would just multiply this to our standard errors. So in that case there, if we had a finite population, how do we even say, hey, we have a finite population? Well, if n over n is greater than 5%, we will use the finite population correction factor. And if that's the case, if we're using that finite population correction factor, well then, X bar will be normally distributed still, centered around mu, but with a standard deviation equal to the standard errors, right? So that's still there, 
times my finite population correction factor. So my standard deviation is being adjusted. That's really what it is, is I'm adjusting my standard deviation down, making it smaller in order to adjust for the fact that my sample size is approaching my population. So how exactly does this work out, right? And to be honest, this is true as well. This is true as well for PBAR. If our sample proportion, right, again, conditions being met for it to be normally normal, we said, okay, centered around pi, with a pi one minus pi all over n. If again, n over n is greater than 5%, we would then multiply this by our finite population correction factor, n minus n all over n minus one. So again, in each case, all we're doing is we're adjusting our standard errors, we're making them smaller, in order to account for the fact that our sample size is approaching the population size. And let's, let's take a look at how that changes things. So if we go back to take a look at our confidence intervals, so confidence intervals, let's take a look at, sig at x bar when sigma was known. Okay, we said, hey, that is gonna be x bar plus or minus rz times sigma x all over root n. But let's suppose that in this case here, we had a population of 100 and we were pulling out a sample size of 30. Well, okay, n over n in that case would be 30%. That would be, hey, we need to use our finite population correction factor. We would throw that in then, and we would throw in, in this case here, 100 minus 30 all over 99, right? That's our finite population correction factor. That was n minus n, n minus 1, throwing in on numerator, denominator. So how exactly that worked out. Same kind of idea, right? If we had x bar with sigma unknown, well, we'd say x bar plus or minus t n minus one s of x root n. And in that case there, we would again just add, multiply on our finite population correction factor. And again, if we assume the same values there, 100 minus 30 all over 99. Just need to correct for these standard errors. Finally, p bar. Well, that would be p bar plus or minus z times, I'll use p this time, so this uh, pi, just to make us familiar with both because they're often used interchangeably. And again, if we had a population of 100 and we were sampling 30, well, then again, that would look like n minus n all over n minus 1, where 100 minus 30 all over 99. Okay, so that is our determining appropriate sample size. That is our finite population correction factor. That does us for this video. If you have any questions on these in particular, please feel free to reach out either through the D2L Frequently Asked Questions or by email. There'll be another video following this that will be taking a look at a bunch of examples of calculating confidence intervals, determining appropriate sample size, and in applying this finite population correction factor. So watch for that video, follow along, try to do them on your own first, and then check back to see if you get the same result. Thanks.